Hello and welcome tonight. Described as a game changer by many, African leaders converge on Lagos as President Mohamedou Buhari inaugurates the world's largest refinery built by Africa's richest man, Aliko Dangote. Warships and fighter jets on display as President Buhari reviews naval fleets to boost Nigeria's marine security assets. Nods and knocks, no doubt, trails the third arm of government under Buhari's eight-year presidency. Tonight, we examine the highs and lows of the judiciary with days to the end of this administration. And on business news tonight, Nigeria Economic Summit Group says newly commissioned Dangote Refinery will create $21 billion per annum for Nigeria's crude oil market. On sports news tonight, the Italian Football Federation slams Juventus with a 10-point deduction over illicit transfer activities, denting the club's hopes of qualifying for next season's Champions League. From Abuja, the nation's capital, presidential election petition court dismisses application by the PDP and Labour Party for live coverage of court proceedings for lack of merit. National news from London, the head of Russia's Wagner Mercenary Group has vowed to transfer control of the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut to the Russian army by the 1st of June. All eyes are on Nigeria today as the world's biggest refinery is officially inaugurated by no less a person than President Mohamed Buhari. The event which took place in the nation's commercial capital, Lagos, attracted the who's who in the country and indeed from the African continent. The facility complex in Leki sits on a land that is more than three times the size of Victoria Island and it's a 650,000 barrels per day integrated refinery located in the Leki Free Trade Zone area of Lagos State. The project, which cost an estimated $19 billion to build, is expected to generate 9,500 direct and 25,000 indirect jobs. Last week, the Nigeria National Petroleum Company Limited said it was set to supply 300,000 barrels of crude oil to Dangote Refinery. The well-attended event was witnessed by captains of industry from across the globe, company executives in the public and private sector, as well as businessmen in the oil and gas industry, serving and past governors, members of the National Assembly, and traditional rulers. President Mohamedou Buhari has described the newly commissioned refinery as a game changer in the country and is calling on the incoming government to build on the success of the Dangote refinery. Now, the president who was speaking while inaugurating the project today also called on African leaders to work together to ensure that they collectively uplift the continent and improve their economies. He notes that this collective work will be the driving force behind achieving Agenda 2063. The president also urges African leaders to pay attention to their youth and private sector as they are essential to achieving this goal. I often sense a quiet expectation that our country is blessed with resources and human capacity to lead Africa's rise to economic prosperity and the attainment of Agenda 20. 63, the Africa we all want. But to achieve the goals of Agenda 2063, Africa must come together. We must integrate our economies, eliminate barriers to trade, and energize our youthful population to scale up our productive capacity. We must create necessary conditions for our private sector to grow and partner with the public sector to accelerate economic growth across the continent. We must not allow outside powers to use some of our leaders to destabilize our economic and political trajectory. The footprints of the Dangote Group 
and the other Nigerian entrepreneurs are popping up in increasing number of sister African countries. The presence at this event of my brothers from Ghana, Togo, and in Niger and Senegal is evidence of the progress in this regard. Meanwhile, the 660,000 oil processing facility is designed to produce crude oil grades from three continents of Africa, Asia, and America. And that's according to the president of the group, Aliko Dangote. Mr. Dangote also revealed that products from the refinery should hit the Nigerian market by July this year. Over two decades ago, we made the commitment to invest in the downstream petroleum sector in response to the inc uh, increasing shortages of petroleum products in our country and the subsequent and the consequent challenges on our economy and its negative impact on the lives and livelihoods of our people. Initially, we thought to enter into the industry by acquiring the brownfield refineries under the federal government's uh, privatization program in 2007. Regrettably, the outcome of the exercise was reversed and our payments returned. This motivated us to rethink our market entry strategy and our business model. We subsequently committed to enter the market boldly with a vision to invest in a greenfield refinery that will transform the industry in Nigeria and Africa as a whole. And that is why we went for the biggest refinery ever built in the world. The facility we are commissioning today is aimed to reposition Nigeria as a key player in the downstream petroleum market of the global, uh, I mean, petroleum sector of the global market. We have built a refinery with a capacity of 650,000 barrels per day of crude oil, plus 900,000 metric tons of polypropylene in a single train, which is the largest build ever. We have selected the best plants and equipment and the latest technology from across the world. Our first goal is to ramp up production of the various production to ensure that within this year, we are able to fully satisfy our nation's demand for higher quality products to enable us to eliminate the tragedy of import dependency and stop once and for all the dumping in our market of toxic substandard petroleum products. Our first product will be in the market before the end of July, beginning of August this year. Our product slate is designed to meet the highest quality standards of the high value products, including premium motor spirit, PMS, automotive gas, oil, diesel, aviation fuel, kerosene, ATK, all of Euro 5 standards that will enable us to meet not only, I mean, not only to meet our country's demand, but also to become a key player in the African and the global market. We're still on the Dangote Refinery Commissioning in Lagos, well, the facility provided a platform for some African leaders to show solidarity with Nigeria and the president of the group, Mr. Aliko Dangote. The presidents of Ghana, Senegal, Niger and Togo were physically present at the commissioning and spoke of the need for economic integration in the continent and continued collaboration among African leaders. The truth is that successful economies depend largely on entrepreneurs running successful businesses. We need to push vigorously in West Africa the culture of entrepreneurship so that we can grow our economies and become prosperous. There is no greater symbol of entrepreneurship in the 21st century, in West Africa and indeed in Africa, than this iconic Nigerian entrepreneur, easily the equal of the celebrated entrepreneurs of our generation. 
The Almighty has blessed our lands with abundant natural resources, and I believe it will be wholly unfair for the world to demand that Africa abandons the exploitation of these resources needed to finance our development and help us to cope better with the threat of climate change at a time when many countries on the continent have only just discovered them. I thus urge countries that have discovered crude oil in West Africa and in Africa to find ways of bringing their substantial hydrocarbon resources to production and quickly too, especially if with the aid of modern technology, exploitation can produce less emissions than occurred in the past. Furthermore, we must add value to these resources and not export them in their raw form if we are to transition to the status of developed countries. The effective management of these resources will depend to a large extent whether we make it or not. And I'm confident that establishments like the Dangote Refinery and Petrochemical Complex will help us realize this dream as quickly as possible. The Dangote Group is certainly helping to meet the challenge of universal access to electricity, to give fertilizer and to give opportunity to industrialize our continent. For a continent that is full of enormous energy resources, it is a paradox to enlighten others while remaining in darkness. We need to produce more of our own electricity and other related products. We need to build what I call the Africa of Solutions through its investment across the continent, the Dangote Group has been part of this Africa of Solutions for several years. In part two after the break, in continuation of our review of various sectors under the Buhari administration in the last eight years, we beam our searchlight on the judiciary. And senior advocate of Nigeria, Ulukayo the Eniton, joins us for an assessment. To join us again. Welcome back. You've just joined us. You're watching the news at 10 live from Channels Television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Described as a game changer by many, African leaders converge on Lagos as President Mohamed Buhari in just refinery built by Africa's richest man, Aliko Dangote. Warships and fighter jets on display as President Buhari reviews the naval fleet to boost Nigeria's marine security assets. And head of Russia's Wagner mercenary group vows to transfer control of the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut to Russian army by June the 1st. We now return to our top story on the Dangote Refinery Commissioning and our energy correspondent Ulu Phillips who was at the event now gives us the details of all that transpired. Barring all fears, concerns and sometimes criticisms against all odds, Nigeria can now confidently tick the box of petroleum product sufficiency in country, courtesy the Dangote Petroleum Refinery and Petrochemicals. It's the commissioning day for this largest plant of its kind in the world, so it had to draw the array of guests that came calling. President is here at this plant complex like he did last year, just as his arrival signals the beginning of proceedings. A 
proud moment it is for Elijah Aliko Dangote. And to clear all doubts regarding today's ceremony, he assures that this plant will refine crude oil and will produce PMS and other petroleum products into the Nigerian market. We have built a refinery with a capacity of 650,000 barrels per day of crude oil plus 900,000 metric tons of polypropylene in a single train, which is the largest built ever. We have selected the best plants and equipment and the latest technology from across the world. Our product slate is designed to meet the highest quality standards of the high value products, including premium motor spirit, PMS, automotive gas, oil, diesel, aviation fuel, kerosene, ATK, all of Euro 5 standards that will enable us to meet, not only to meet our country's demand, but also to become a key player in the African and the global market. Our coastal location and offshore loading and offloading single point mooring facilities with the capacity to receive all our crude oil supplies and evacuate up to 75% of our liquid products, giving us direct access to the rest of Africa and the global market. For the numbers, one of the persons who saw returns on investment of this project says Nigeria's economy will practically become better for it. The takeoff of this refinery comes with numerous economic benefits to Nigeria. In the first instance, it will generate thousands of direct jobs of over 135,000 permanent jobs. I'm also proud to state that electricity of about 12,000 megawatts of electricity will also be generated. More importantly, this project avails Nigeria with significant savings, both in terms of foreign exchange and in easing the fiscal burden of our federal government. This project is cited in Lagos and it could have been elsewhere. So it speaks fortune and the host governor feels honored. 45 years ago, and you see the coincidence in the story, 45 years ago, who came to Lagos all the way from another mega city in our country, Kano? Who saw the prosperity, the diversity of our country? Who came with nothing, but in 45 years has built the biggest empire in the world for Africa? <laughs> It's his last week at work before he bows out. It turns out to be a busy one, old by this historic yeah, event. President much. Muhammad Buhari has got some bragging rights here. I often sense a quiet expectation that our country is blessed with resources and human capacity to lead Africa's rise to economic prosperity and the attainment of Agenda 2063 the Africa we all want. But to achieve the goals of Agenda 2063, Africa must come together. We must integrate our economies, eliminate barriers to trade, and energize our youthful population to scale up our productive capacity. voice is the vice president-elect who is standing in for the president-elect. This should be an inspiration for whatever they hold there when work resumes. That the Dangote refinery will be the most consequential single project to come on stream in recent times and is bound to have a huge impact on the growth and development of our economy and positively influence the life and well-being of our people. At the end of the remarks, Mr. President then leads some select group to a tour of the plant and then commissions saying. For the records, the quality of petroleum products from this plant is the Euro 5 quality and that's world class. It will also export some in addition to meeting domestic requirements plus the petrochemical components. Aliko and I bought the Portacot and Cardona refinery. I owned 20% of that consortium. And of course, it was reversed by the administration that came in then. What a big shame. Big shame today. See what Aliko has done today. This to me 
is a lesson that government cannot run any business. And government should desist from trying to run a business. It's not a very easy thing to pull. And even if you ask me, would I repeat something like this again? My answer would be no. It's clearly a game changer for the downstream oil and gas sector in Nigeria. Onu Phillips, Channel of Television News. Other eight years of President Mohamedou Buhari's administration can be described as quite eventful but also controversial in the history of the Nigerian judiciary. I spoke with the senior advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Ulukayodi Enito, earlier today concerning the sector. I started by asking him if there's been an improvement in the welfare of judicial officers under the current administration. They are not better off than where they were eight years ago. As far as welfare of the justices uh, is concerned, there hasn't been much of an improvement. But, uh, I, I'm, I'm aware that uh, a lot of the, particularly federal judicial staff, uh, not judicial staff, but uh, justices, uh, a lot of them are having to leave more or less out of hotel rooms. They do not have accommodation. They do not have um, the uh, full complement of their offices up to the Supreme Court. All right, so how would you describe the relationship between the executive arm of government and the judiciary in the last eight years when you consider that at a point uh, the president openly accused judges of corruption? But anyone can make accusations. But you don't stop there. If you're saying, and I've, I've always said this, if you're going to say that judges are corrupt, don't just brush everybody with the same staff. You have to be specific. You have to identify. And once you identify, you have to follow through. So it shouldn't just be, oh, the executive has accused the judiciary of uh, being corrupt. No, go for that. Prove your allegation. Anything else is, is just uh, calling a dog a bad name so that you can have a reason to shoot it, not to hang. So President Buhari vigorously campaigned on the promise of fighting corruption. Tell me, how would you rate the fight in the last eight years? Anything worthy of note in that regard? Worthy of note? You see, uh, it's one thing to mouth will fight corruption, we will fight corruption. But I do not see corruption being fought in the fact that you uh, EFCC was able to obtain verdicts of guilty and convictions of uh, young men and women doing petty computer fraud here and there. The fight against corruption, properly so-called, looking at big tickets, big items. Of course, EFCC also had its own um, challenges particularly as, uh, with respect to government, governors and state government. But that is not the only uh, area where we can say there are corrupting influences or uh, what we tag corruption. And can we even look at it? Exactly what is corruption? Is corruption the refusal to follow the dictates of the Constitution with regards to appointment? Would it be corruption if you see a lopsided uh, 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 release of resources? Would it be corruption where uh, government impact is felt in one section more than the other? Still ahead on the news at 10. 
Nigeria Economic Summit Group says newly commissioned Dangote refinery will create $21 billion per annum for Nigeria's crude oil market. That's on business news. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the News at 10. Let's head over to the nation's capital. And Victor Mathias is standing by to give us the very latest. Victor, over to you. Very much thanks and welcome to the nation's capital, Abuja, where we begin with the judiciary as the presidential election petition court has dismissed the applications brought before it by the presidential candidates of the People's Democratic Party, Atiku Abubakar and Labour Party, Peter Obi, asking that the daily proceedings be televised. In a unanimous ruling, the five-man panel led by Justice Haruna Samani dismissed the applications for lacking in merit and not supported by law. Our correspondent, Emanuela Ikele, reports. It's the nine other pre-hearing session of petitions by the People's Democratic Party, Labour Party and the Allied People's Movement, challenging the emergence of the All Progressive Congress's candidate, Bola Tinubu, as the president-elect. The courtroom fills up gradually with lawyers and some party members waiting for the commencement of the day's proceedings. The five-man panel of justices arrive and first treats the petition of the Allied People's Movement. Just like other parties, the APM streamlines its witnesses to just one person and requests three days for the witness to testify. The Independent National Electoral Commission and the All Progressive Congress says they will be calling one witness each, while the counsel to Tinubu will be calling three witnesses in four days. Done with the streamlining of witnesses, the court turned its attention to the applications by the PDP and the Labour Party, asking for live coverage of the court's daily proceedings. The court dismissed the application on the grounds that there was no regulatory framework or policy direction permitted it to grant the application. It further held that the petition has failed to establish how the live coverage of the proceedings will advance the case, adding the live broadcast will not add to the determination of the petitions, plus the fact that the request was not part of the reliefs in the petitions before it. Another matter before the court was that of consolidation of the three different petitions before it. The president-elect and the all-progressive Congress oppose the move, insisting that merging the petitions will affect the ability to effectively defend all the issues that were raised by the petitioners. They added that the petitioners did not only raise various issues but are seeking different reliefs. The PDP believes consolidating the petitions will help for expeditious hearing, while the Labour Party, APM and INEC have left the decision to the discretion of the court. The court in its wisdom decided that the subject of our application, i.e. the live streaming and open telecast, is not in any way connected with the merits of our petition. The petition is separate, it's ongoing. The application did not succeed to have the televised version of the proceedings relate to the entire world. The court says it's a policy matter. We are not part of the policy making apparatus of the court or any court for that matter. We are a council and the duty is to bring whatever request we have to the court. If they agree, we say as the court pleases. If they disagree, we still say as the court pleases. So that's the position. They have disagreed and we are moving on. The pre-hearing session at the presidential election petition court has finally ended. It has now fixed Tuesday the 23rd of May to give its report, during which it will state its position on the three surviving petitions before it. Emanuela Ekele, Channels Television News. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court has fixed May the 26th to deliver judgment in a suit seeking the disqualification of Bola Tinubu and Kashim Shatima as presidential and vice presidential candidates of the All Progressives Congress, APC. In the suit filed in July 2022, the PDP claimed that Shatima's nomination as Tinubu's running mates was in breach of the provisions of sections 29, 33, 35, and 84 of the Electoral Act 2022. 
The party argued that Shatima's nomination to contest the position of vice president and Borono's central senatorial seat at the same time contravened extant law. The PDP, which sought an order disqualifying the APC, Tinubu and Shatima from contesting the presidential election, also sought an order nullifying their candidacies. However, Justice Ian Echo of the Federal High Court and the Court of Appeal dismissed the suit on the grounds that the PDP lacked the local standi to institute the suit. Not satisfied, the PDP appealed the judgment and the judge dismissed the appeal as the PDP failed to establish its locus standi. And away from the courts now, the River State Governor Yesem Wike has revealed plans by the state government to introduce a policy that will mandate medical students under its scholarship to work for a number of years for the state upon graduation. The governor was speaking during the inauguration of a 500-bed hostel for medical students of the River State University, whose pioneers set on state-funded scholarship. Ahead of the inauguration of a new governor in River State, the government is here to commission these three hostel blocks for medical students of the River State University. The portion of land on which the units of three-story buildings are sited is part of a newly established College of Medicine in the old Port Harcourt Township area, which will provide a 500-bed space for the students. It is going to improve their mental well-being. Number two, it's going to improve their physical well-being. Number three, it is going to relatively make them safer in terms of um, road traffic accident and then the duration of being transporting them from one point to another during lectures and um, clinical activities will be averted. The Vice Chancellor of the University says the project has further placed the institution as one of the highest ranking in the country. It has further re-emphasized the ranking of our medical college as the best in the country in terms of physical infrastructure, medical equipment, and provision of quality academic and non-academic staff. The capacity here, as has been said, is for 500 students. But in full capacity, it will accommodate 600 students. Before inaugurating the project, Governor Nyeson Wike promises the payment of scholarship before leaving office, but says the state government is considering a policy that will mandate beneficiaries of his medical education scholarship to work for the state for a period of time upon graduation. What we have decided to do now, because let us not train these students and they run away, they must have the state first. So we are bringing up a policy that if we give you scholarship and train you to become a doctor, you must have a number of years, you must also serve the state. We don't, we don't, we don't give you scholarship, then after training you, then you run to somewhere and say, oh, uh, they gave me offer in the verse of uh, Kapachan. I'm not going to accept that. You must, I mean, we are not training you to go and serve other people. We are training you to serve the uh, river state. So after that, those number of years, you are serving the state, you can uh, go to where you want to go. He then inaugurated the blocks of hostels. Governor Wike also inaugurated 24 units of two- and three-bedroom senior staff quarters at the main campus of the River State University. Now, GTEx Holdings, a group of companies into real estate, has held its 15th anniversary in Lagos. The event took place at Eco Hotel in Suites, and it coincides with the book signing of the group's chairman, Mr. Stephen Akintayo. GTEx Holdings, a conglomerate founded as a small venture 15 years ago, has hosted friends of its business in an event held in Lagos. It's a double celebration for the founder, who has three publications added to the list of books he's authored. The event opens with the author summarizing the contents of the three new books and why it would be a good read for everyone. An investment. Um... Stephen Akita has made good success as a digital marketer, real estate mogul, author, and life coach. He speaks on his approach as a serial entrepreneur. You guys are the ones by calling me. So one of the things that have helped, and I mean, uh, we have a lot of our clients here, we have a lot of our investors here. One of these I leveraged on was social capital, right? Once you have a good name, people will give you money. 99% of my clients, I don't know them. People, we have an investment fund where people invest and they get returns. And we have also tried not to default. Since we started, we've never defaulted on return on investment for our investors. GTEx Homes, 
the real estate arm of the conglomerate is not only contributing to solving the housing deficit challenge in Nigeria, it is also creating impact through its special programs. The grant we won a $5,000 grant, and I can tell you that being uh, a small business, we are at the verge of scaling up. So we have the obje objective of making sure that we get our foods and spices and our present product that is selling in the market called Fat Spices to every home. And what that simply means that GTEx and Stephen Akintaya Foundation has supported us to buy at least one good equipment we need to enable us scale our production. It's just about changing life positively for us in the real estate sector. It's not just about people buying properties. It's not just about people actually having um, money from it. It's about helping to change the destiny of people, helping to change the lives of people. The group is targeting more investment through innovation and integrity. We're a growing real estate company, right? one of the biggest brands in the world. We're the leading developers at Africa's biggest green and smart home developers. right? So watch out. And what are you doing? You have to invest more with us. Representative of GTEx Homes and innovative real estate firms say they will continue to build and adapt to the ever-changing real estate market. That's it from the nation's capital. It's back to Ayatinde in Lagos with the rest of the news at 10. Many thanks, Victor. Let's now join Anne Waldo to give us the very latest in the world of business. Thank you, Ayatunde. Hello and welcome to Business News. Let's begin with Nigeria Economic Summit, which has made its forecast for what Nigeria will benefit from the much-awaited multi-billion dollar Dangote refinery, which is Africa's biggest oil refinery and the world's biggest single-train petroleum facility. According to the NESG, the newly commissioned refinery is projected to create a market of $21 billion per annum for Nigeria's crude oil sector and meet 100% requirements for all local liquid petro products. The NEPC's data forecast further shows that more than 117 tank farms will be created from the 650,000 barrels per day crude oil facility with about 2,900 total tanker loading capacity, handling a total of 4.742 billion liters of refined petro products, among other expectations. Meanwhile, the group managing director of the Nigerian Petroleum Company Limited, Melekiari, has laid out some of the deliverables expected from the newly inaugurated Dangote Refinery and Petrochemical Company. He was speaking at an exclusive interview with Channels Television. Mr. Kiari also pointed out how the new facility will complement other refineries in the country. It is very clear that our country will become the next exporter of petroleum product in a very, very short while. This refinery comes to, into stream, NMPC completes its rehabilitation, which will be a regional hub for petroleum products. There is no confusion, no uncertainty. I think the dream there is coming very, very close to us. First of all, the rehab is in pieces. First of all, you can start fuels from a plant without necessarily completing your process. That means that in the Potaco refinery, we'll see first fuel before the end of this year. This is our target and we'll deliver this and hopefully even complete the process uh, by, by end of next year. So clear, uh, the, of course, we're refinery, same phase, we're accelerating it. Uh, so very likely also that it can come into on stream in 2024. And Kaduna refinery, it will match the schedule of worry refinery because we're doing an accelerated process. It's a 15-month project process, and we know that we have already commenced this. It will also come on stream by next year. So overall, by the end of next year, you will have uh, clearly excess ability to produce in this country, and this country will be a next level of petroleum products. So actually, we are looking forward to more refining capacity in this country so that every barrel produced in this country is converted to value so that you can export finished product. It's, it's not the end of it. If we make 3 million barrels, we should be able to process 3 million barrels in country. Well, let's head to the local market where it kicked up the fourth trading week and the bullish note. Investors bargain hunting for the shares of Telth and Giants, MTN Nigeria and some other sounded equities. Will Ibong has the details. Welcome to the Stock Market Report. It's a great start to the week and sentiments may be especially positive with the launch of the 650,000 barrels per day capacity Dangote refinery. The All Share Index kicked off higher today by 0.35% to settle at 52,369 points with the market cap appreciating about, by about 
182 billion naira. However, the buzz of the Dangote refinery launch did not rub off well on the oil and gas index as it dropped today by 0.64%. And Adoba was largely responsible for that. The stock dropped 6.95% today. The banking stocks, however, made good moves. We see it up to 0.89%, and this is on the back of gains in GT Co, which rose over 2%. We saw Zenit Bank up 1.73%, and we also saw UBA rising to the challenge in that counter by, you know, in today's trading session. Now, central banks, MPC, meet Tuesday and Wednesday, and the market appears to be ignoring any sign of a possible rate hike. And that's the stock market report for today. I'm Will Ibang. <laughs> That's business news. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. It's back to you yesterday. Well, it was indeed a busy day for President Mohamedou Buhari as he headed to the Navy dockyard in Victoria Island, Lagos, for the Presidential Fleet Review 2023, where he commissioned the NNS Kada, NNS Ibeno, and one Augusta helicopter. The president is also hopeful that given the progress made already in a local construction of seaward vessels, the Nigerian Navy will soon begin to build large warships for itself. On the other hand, President Buhari declared that piracy had reduced significantly over the past seven years, which culminated in the listing Nigeria from the list of piracy-prone countries by the International Maritime Bureau in March 2022. A group of saboteurs are said to have crossed from Ukraine into Russia's Belgorod region with resulting clashes injuring several people, according to Russian authorities. Well, here's Simon Pussy with more on this in international news and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the channel's studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. The head of Russia's Wagner mercenary group has vowed to transfer control of the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut to the Russian army by the 1st of June. Wagner founder Yevgeny Priyazhin claimed to have captured Bakhmut, but Kyiv says it still controls parts of the city. Ukraine also says its troops are still advancing on the outskirts, but Mr Priyazhin says his troops will start handing over the city to the Russian army on Thursday. It looks like Bakhmut is still contested. I mean, the Russians are in a dominating position on the ground within the city itself, and have pushed the Ukrainians very far west. But then the Ukrainians look like they're also now pressing on the northern southern flanks. But ultimately speaking, you need to see the battle in a wider picture that the Russians have pushed everything they had at it since August and have only just sort of captured the town. But equally, when you look at the imagery, I mean, there's nothing left of the town. It's a very insignificant point on the broader map. And actually what's really been, it, it's all been about is to try and fix each fort so that they can't fight in other places. The head of the World Health Organization has urged countries to carry out the reforms needed to prepare for the next pandemic and honor a previous commitment to boost financing for the UN Health Agency. Speaking to the WHO's annual health assembly, weeks after ending the global emergency status for the COVID-19 pandemic, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyes said it was time to advance negotiations on preventing the next one. When the next pandemic comes knocking, and it will, we must be ready to answer decisively, collectively, and equitably. Eyewitness video shows emergency officials taking care of collapsed fans on the pitch at the soccer stadium in El Salvador. <laughs> at least 12 people died and an unspecified number were injured in a stampede at the stadium in the capital city. Alianza FC and Club Deportivo FAS were playing the second leg of their playoff quarter-final game when the match was suspended after the stampede broke out in the general section of the bench area. A Belarusian opposition activist arrested after his Ryanair flight was forced to land in the capital Minsk has been pardoned, that's according to state media. <laughs> Roman Protasevich was hauled off his flight and arrested on charges of inciting unrest in May 2021. Earlier this month, he was sentenced to eight years in prison. It is not immediately clear what the pardon means for his jail sentence, which state media previously reported would be served in a penal colony. 
Officials say at least 20 children have died in a fire in the central Guianese mining town of Madia. The fire broke out just after midnight on Monday, engulfing a secondary school dormitory and trapping students. The government says emergency services are struggling to contain the fire because of bad weather conditions. Several more people have been injured and transferred to hospital. Facebook's owner Meta has been fined 1.2 billion euros for mishandling people's data when transferring it between Europe and the United States. Issued by Ireland's Data Protection Commission, it is the largest fine imposed under the EU's General Data Protection Regulation Privacy Law. GDPR sets out rules companies must follow to transfer user data outside of the EU. Meta says it will appeal against the unjustified and unnecessary ruling. And a life-size Lego Ferrari car has been unveiled in Denmark. Built in the Czech Republic with the help of Ferrari designers, the model car took 339 days to complete and used 383,610 Lego bricks. That's according to Legoland Billund. Two, in, Vasco! Ferrari wheels and a steering wheel were the only original components used for the 1.34 ton life-size model. Visitors posed for photos and marveled at the Lego car's working lights and distinctive design. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, I mean, obviously the real car is incredibly impressive and has an amazing sculpture, but to actually manage to replicate those sculptural forms in Lego bricks is, is really impressive. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel's studios in Lagos. Thanks, Simon. It is now time for sports news. Juventus' hopes of making it to the Champions League has been dented by a 10-point deduction after a revision of the initial 15-point penalty inflicted on the club over illicit transfer activity. The new sanction announced by the Italian Football Federation pushes them out of the top four with two matches remaining for them this season. Now it's a different narrative for Newcastle United who have secured a Champions League spot after 20 years with a goalless draw against a relegation threatened Leicester City at St. James's Park. While a goalless draw rarely suit both sides, Newcastle United will feel extremely satisfied to make it back to the Champions League after a very long period. Other stories now, Spanish prosecutors have opened a probe into a racist chant aimed at Real Madrid player Vinicius Jr. During a match, uh, the Football Federation president admitted they had a problem with racism. Vinicius was targeted by a home fan during a 1-0 defeat at Valencia on Sunday and was later sent off. And that's it on Sports News. It's back to you today for the rest of the news at 10. And the main news again. It was a collection of who's who in Lagos today as President Mohamed Buhari inaugurated Dangote's 650,000 barrels per day refinery. While the President and other African leaders present spoke glowingly about the prospects of the refinery, not only on the Nigerian economy, but on that of the African continent. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ayo Tunde Balogun. Do have a good night.